Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you today. Hope you had a good week. I am thrilled that you're here. We're going to talk about a few things today, but I want you to know right from the beginning that I have one major goal in this message today. And my one major goal is this. If you are here today and you have never been baptized, or if you've been baptized years ago, but you have sensed God is calling you to do this and you've felt it for, you, for months and months and you keep kind of putting it off. If you're at a place where you need to take that step of baptism, my one goal is to try to remove every one of your excuses for taking that step today and provide an opportunity for you to get baptized. Somebody right now is already thinking like, I don't know, man. I mean, I need to do that, but I, I don't have time to do that. And that's why I'm going to let you out of church early today. We're not only going to cover some objections, but I'm going to let you out where you could get baptized and still get in your car at roughly the same time. Because you know sometimes I go long anyway. So, so this is good. Anyway, that's my one primary goal. I want to plant that seed in your heart and mind today. I think when it comes to baptism, when it comes to kind of every area of life, one of the biggest challenges that we face in our culture today is just how distracted we are by all the things coming at us. Anybody feel distracted in your life? Like there's just so much going on. Even something as simple as, as watching uh, the television. I, I don't know what goes on in, in your, your home or your apartment, but when we watch TV in our home, I, I always do a thing called double double screening. You know, you have the show and then you have your computer in your lap or your phone that you're looking at, right? And I tend to judge a show how good it is based on whether I can double screen with that show well. Sometimes I'll be like, Lori, everybody loved this show and it's just, it's just not good. And Lori's like, the show is amazing, but you don't watch the show, Judd. You watch your phone and you just want to look up. And then if it's like detailed and intricate and actually has a plot... You get frustrated because you're like, I don't understand what just happened. I like to watch those shows that are just easy to make sense of, right? So I can be like doing my thing, I'm surfing, I'm looking at stuff, and then I can look up and be like, ha, that was funny. And then I'm back down into my stuff, right? But double screening is a thing. When our kids were younger, we would do family movie night and we would all gather around and it really became like, nobody watched the movie. We all watched each other because Lori had a rule, no other technology during the movie. And so everybody would just look around and be like, hey, dad's looking at his phone right now or mom's slipping the iPad up on the side. You know, it was it's that kind of a deal because we're just so distracted. And I think spiritually, when it comes to baptism, there's a lot of distraction. I think there's, 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 several different groups of people here today. There are people that, man, you, you, you um, have already been baptized years ago, and maybe you're in a season in your life where you're kind of disconnected from what that really means for you and what that really represented in your life because you're just pulled in a million directions. Or maybe you're here today, and maybe you've, you've never taken that step of baptism, maybe because you don't understand why it's important or why it's significant, or maybe just because you've never made the time and all the distractions, you're like, yeah, 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 I need to do that. <laughs> but I just haven't done it yet. And so I want to give you that opportunity today. I think a lot of what we struggle with in our culture can be summed up in the old character from the movie Up. You remember Doug the dog? I'll bring a little picture up here. There's Doug the dog. Remember him? Like the thing about Doug the dog is no matter what was happening in the conversation, there would always be a moment where he would stop and look away and say what? Squirrel. 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 And it's hard spiritually when you're always pulled in a million directions to focus and to stop. And so I want to do that with you today around this whole idea of baptism and what it means in our life. Baptism is an outer expression of an inner transformation in our life. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 2. Let me read this. When I get to the red word, I just ask you to say it real loud here with me. It's how we keep everybody awake here. But this is what Paul says. He says, this is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of what? Of grace, a new life in a new land. He says in baptism, we go under the water. We're, we're, it's a symbol of the fact that we're leaving the old behind. We come up out of the water. We're walking in the new life that God has for us in our lives. So a couple thoughts. One is to simply pay attention to your rescue. 
Pay attention to your rescue. Remember your baptism if you've been baptized. Remember what God has done in your life. Uh, we have a little puppy at home, and uh, she's in the chewing phase. And we love her. She's awesome. But she chews on everything she's not supposed to chew on. Doesn't matter what, like, like furniture, socks, shoes, whatever she's not supposed to chew on, that's what she goes to. So I, I grabbed some uh, spray that's supposed to make dogs not chew on things. This spray is called bitter apple. I'm like, oh, bitter apple, right? So I spray it on all the things. She loves it. Seriously, it's like the greatest thing she's ever tasted in her life. I'm like, what is happening right now? But she's like, oh, this is so good. You know, so I've been experimenting. Although I did have a guy that was with the canine unit um, last night. He goes, Judd, he goes, this will help. He goes, take the spray and spray it in her mouth. Then spray it on stuff. And she'll be like thinking twice. I'm like, okay, that's good. That's good. I haven't had the heart to try it yet, but I'm, I'm going to get there. Just feels cruel, right? It's like, she's going to have to chew up something really good. Then I'll be like, open your mouth, dog. Ah, take that. She chews on everything she shouldn't. And I think we as adults often sort of chew mentally on all the things we shouldn't right? We, we chew on our worry. We chew on our fear. We, you know, we're, 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 some of you, you're graduating or you have family graduating. It's supposed to be a celebration, but you're already chewing on all that worry and fear related to their future and future kids or no kids. And are they ever going to get married? And you know, am I ever going to be able to get a decent job? And I'm, You're like living five and 10 years out and you've already kind of lost perspective on the beauty of the moment, right? Right? Some of you, some of you aren't there. Some of you are just thankful that by the grace of God, you made it this far. When I graduated high school, the vice principal at our school walked past me. I was sitting at the graduation and she stopped and looked down at me. She didn't like me very much. And she said, Will Height, I never thought I'd see you here. <laughs> I'm not, no joke. God's my witness. And then she just kept walking. I'm like, nice to see you too. Thank you. Anyway, we chew on all the wrong things. And I think one of the things about baptism is it's a reminder for those of us that have been baptized to sort of reflect and chew on the goodness of God and reflect and chew on all that he's done in our life and all that he's rescued us from. You know, every day I read a psalm and just pray through it. It's what I do devotionally uh, for a few minutes in the morning. And so I've been through the book of Psalms many times. And one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 107. Because in this psalm, the writer gives four different um, characteristics or people uh, that are uh, involved in different situations in their life. And there's this rhythm that happens where there's a problem that's described, and then there's a cry to God for help, and then God responds and helps, and then the response of those individuals is supposed to be praise. Let's look at all four of these. Uh, the first person uh, that gets described as somebody who's lost, Psalm 107. Seven verse 4. It says, some wandered in the wilderness, what? Lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty, and they nearly died. You ever felt lost in your life? You ever felt like you're in the wilderness? Some of you are there right now. You ever feel like, man, I'm hungry. I'm not sure where it's coming from, where the food's coming from, where the, the provision's coming from. I just feel like I'm in this wilderness season in my life. And they cried out, Lord, help in their trouble. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for all the wonderful things that he has done for them. Listen, if you've ever been lost in your life, if God has rescued you and led you to a place of safety, if he's done a miracle in your life that you couldn't even describe if you tried, if he's brought you through what seemed impossible in your life, then let you give praise to God. In fact, right now, I'm just going to ask you to put your hands together and give praise to him who did that amazing work in your life. And I think one of the reasons Paul in Romans 6 basically says, remember your baptism, is because it takes you back to that, to the rescue that God did in your life. Here's another individual, and that's uh, the rebel. <laughs> any of you, any of you a rebel? You don't have to raise your hand, but yeah. By the way, some of you are going to be like, I think I'm every one of these people. That's how I felt, so... Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. Mm. 
they what? Rebelled. You see that? They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. So they're in this situation because of their own choices and their own actions. Sound familiar? But look at this. Even then, they cried out, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and deepest gloom. He snapped their chains. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. If you've ever been in darkness, if you've ever felt imprisoned and trapped, if you've ever been in a situation where it was bad and the truth is you had nobody to blame but yourself for the fact that you ended up in that situation and God rescued you anyway, even though you didn't deserve it, come on somebody, even though like, like it wasn't because of anything you did, it was just his goodness and his grace and he brought you into the light and he put your feet on solid ground and he rescued you and redeemed you. The Bible says, let them praise the Lord. He saves rebels. <laughs> and he, I always say he takes rebels, he breaks rebels, and then he gives rebels a very real cause and releases them with that cause to bring praise to his name. Here's another individual and that is the fools. Anybody? Well, I won't. Okay. Some were what? Fools. <laughs> I've been a fool too many times in my life. They rebelled and they suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food and they were knocking on death's door. Lord, help. They cried in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things that he has done for them. So we got the lost, we got the rebel, we got the fool. And in every case, whether life put them in that circumstance or whether they made choices that put them in their circumstance, when they cried out to God, he was good enough to hear and to rescue them and to move in their life. And so the psalmist says, Let, let's give him praise and let's give him thanks. And then one more, and that is the captive. Look at this. It says, some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. And their ships were what? Tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. And the sailors cringed in terror. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper. That's good. To a whisper and stilled the waves. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things that he has done for them. I want to share this with you because as I'm reading through this psalm, I always love it, Psalm 107. But I always stop at these different scenarios. And I think Paul is saying, look, remember your baptism because it takes you back to when God rescued you. And it takes you back to what he did in your life. And here's what it does. It moves your attention from all the stress and all the anxiety and all the worry going on. And it reminds you, you know what? God rescued me and I didn't even deserve it. God moved in my life when I was a rebel, when I was lost, when I was a captive, when I was a fool. He's still rescued me and saved me in Jesus Christ and brought me through the darkness into his light. And so I can trust him with my future. Every day is a gift. I can recognize every moment is a gift. I can live with an open hand and I don't have to carry all this worry. <laughs> pay attention to your, your baptism and then pay attention to your, your questions. Pay attention to your questions. Some of you have questions as it relates uh, to baptism. Some of you don't even really understand, like, what is baptism? Well, baptism is simply going down in the water and coming up out of the water. Real simple, okay? And we don't hold you under. <laughs> Not too long, anyway. Just a couple kicks, and then we'll bring you, bring you up. No, I'm kidding. But it's a very important act that we see in the Bible. Followers of Jesus throughout the book of Acts, 
in the New Testament, the very first thing that they do after they place their faith and trust in Christ is they get baptized. The very first thing that they do. They don't, they don't weigh it. It's not like, oh, let me go think about it and get it all worked out and I'll come back a year later. In Acts, what you see is they immediately just get baptized. Let's do it. You know, let's commit to it. And so baptism is a picture of the fact that you go under the water, you come back up, you've been washed of your sins by the grace of God, um, by his power in your life. It also is a picture of what Jesus did for us, that he died, that he was placed in a tomb for three days, and that we believe he rose again. And so in baptism, it says you're literally buried with Christ in baptism. You're united with him in his death. And then you come up out of the water, and it's a picture of the fact that you will walk in the newness of life he has for you, and that one day, just as he rose from the dead, you too will rise from the dead. That's what's captured in the imagery of baptism. And baptism is a pledge of devotion and loyalty to Jesus Christ. It's saying, God, I'm yours. I surrender to you. I'm following you. That's it. Now, the Bible doesn't say that like who baptizes you is most important. In fact, in the New Testament, there was some debate going on. And, and the Apostle Paul writes about, look, I'm glad, you know, like, like that I didn't baptize you because you know, these people were all arguing like, did so-and-so baptize? Your baptism's only good if so-and-so baptized you. And the reality is like, it's not about who baptizes you. It's just about pledging your faith to Jesus Christ. Nor is there anything like special about where you're baptized. I've baptized people outside. I've baptized them in pools. One time we were going to do this special baptism with a guy and, and we met at this uh, can Powder Canyon in Texas and we hiked out, but it was like a drought and every water crossing, there was no water. This was getting very disturbing because I had like 50 people with me, you know, and so about a mile in, everybody's dying, and I finally come to this one little creek, and I'm like, well, this will have to work, you know, lay down. So the guy lays down, so we just sort of splashed it on him. You just, you, I'm just saying, like, don't get too caught up in the externals of what that moment means. It's, it's a powerful moment. And it's God that makes it powerful and his spirit that makes it powerful in our lives. Um, and so some of you, maybe you were, you were baptized as an infant. The question I often am asked is like, you know, I was, I was sprinkled as an infant, maybe in the Catholic church or a different faith tradition, and, and should I be baptized again? And I would say like, if your parents took you and dedicated you to the Lord and, and you were sprinkled as an infant. First of all, that's an amazing thing your parents did. Like they love you. They cared about you. They dedicated you to God. And, you know, they had that sacred moment. Um, my challenge to you is, as you look through the Bible, you don't see any cases of infant baptism. So I think part of the power of baptism is being able to remember that you were baptized and remember that moment for yourself and look back at it. So if you were baptized as an infant, I would just say, uh, your parents did a wonderful thing for you. It was amazing. I don't want to take anything away from what they did. But if you're at a place of your faith now where God has been pulling on your heart to take that step, I would encourage you to take it, not to denounce what your parents did, but actually to fulfill it. You think about this, when your parents took you to the church and had you dedicated and sprinkled, they were saying, not only God protect my child, but may my child grow up to follow God and trust them in their life. And that's exactly what you're doing as you continue on in your faith journey. You're growing to a place of more trust and more faith. And if you feel convicted about that, I believe you should do it in a way that you can remember and look back on. It's not that the water saves you. The water doesn't save you. Jesus saves us through faith. But the water reminds us. It reminds us of that, that tangible expression that we have of surrendering our life to Jesus Christ. Uh, other people think, well, you know, I was baptized already as an adult. Should I be baptized again? Like, I'm not sure it worked. Some of you are like, I, I don't know, it's been a rough year, COVID, all that. Like, I, maybe you need to hold me under for a little while, a few kicks before you bring me back up, right? I get it. I get it. But I don't, 
I don't think there's any need necessarily for somebody to be baptized more than once. And that would be my encouragement to you. Now, look, there are people that are like, hey, when I was 12 years old, I was baptized. And then, you know, I, I went and, and lived La Vida Loca for, right, 20 years. And, and now I'm coming back and God's like grabbing a hold of my heart. And it, it's, I just feel convicted. I need to get baptized again at this stage in my life. Well, great. Nobody's going to get in your way. I'll celebrate that. But I just don't want anybody to feel a false sense of responsibility like they need to get baptized again and again and again because uh man if if that's what it was about we would just never get out of the water i've said it before we just have like hot tubs all in the parking lot and it would just be like people just stay in all the time if going under the water is what forgave you so you don't need to get baptized again and again and again but if god is clearly calling you or convicting you to do that and you want to take that step nobody will get in your way we'll celebrate it with you uh, another question people have is, hey, do I need to have my life together before I get baptized? You know, this is what, uh, this is something I hear a lot. People are like, man, I, I, I talked to a guy last night, a friend of mine. He's been here for 20 years. He came as like a one-year-old the year that I came here in 2003. So he's been here forever. He told me last night, i never been baptized. I'm like, what? How many times you heard me give this sermon? And he's like, yeah, I know. I just kind of always feel like, you know, I got to work my stuff out. I'm like, dude, seriously. And so we had a good talk. And I think we're going to, I think it's going to happen. We're going to do it. But let me just talk to those of you that feel like, man, if I get baptized and I don't have all this junk worked out of my life, I'm like double condemned or something, you know, like it's even, it's even worse. Look, you don't get cleaned up to take a bath, right? That'd be crazy. Like, what are you doing? Oh, man, I got to clean up. I'm going to take a shower. You know, like, you, 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 you just take a bath, right? That's how you get cleaned up. And when it comes to baptism, you see it. The early followers of Jesus, they were baptized immediately. It's not like they went back and worked out everything in their life. That would take your whole life to do, by the way. You know, none of us would ever get baptized if it was about some moral perfection that we needed to reach before we got baptized. Baptism is saying, God, I need your help. I'm committed to you. I need your help with this issue, with this addiction, with this thing going on in my life. I need your strength. I need your power. Baptism is coming to God and, and saying, I'm surrendered. I have issues, I need your help. And you don't have to work up to some supernatural level. Anybody who believes can be baptized. Baptism was so important that Jesus modeled it for us. He walked 60 miles to be baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, 60 miles. And um, he did that as a picture for all of us in our lives, so it's important. In fact, uh, over a decade, ago, I remember uh, talking to a friend of mine who's a pastor in California, and uh, they had an individual in their church who was from Indonesia, and he was trying to work out how he could stay in our country because of the religious persecution that they had faced in Indonesia as a Christian family. And in the midst of this whole process, my friend, uh, Pastor Chuck, had to go down and testify on his behalf with the uh, governmental authorities as he was trying to get certain um, uh, things, uh, requirements met so that he could stay in the country. And he said it was interesting. Um, the one question they asked him, he said only one. He had this whole thing prepared. He was going to go on and on about this guy's name was Jimmy and all that Jimmy did and how he volunteered and he served and he really believed and he was a great guy. And he said that he gets there and they're like, um, is he a baptized believer in Jesus Christ? And my, my friend says, yes. And they're like, okay, we're done. And he's like, well, you know, there's more. But he said, the only question the government's asking is this, is he a baptized believer in Jesus Christ? And one of the things they found in, um, in one season, at least, with uh, these individuals coming into our country is certain people could be terrorists, they could be part of any number of religious groups, and they might say they're Christians or they're followers of Jesus, but they wouldn't say they were a baptized follower of Jesus because they understood baptism was a powerful and important step. And if you took that step, that, that was significant. So the government began to ask, are you a baptized believer in Jesus Christ as the delineation for your faith? 
I think it's, if it's important to the government, <laughs> if it's important to people of other religions, hello, how much more important should it be for us as followers of Jesus? Look at this, Acts chapter 8, Philip's riding along with this Ethiopian. He basically comes to faith in Jesus Christ, and the first thing this Ethiopian says, he says, look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Like, what's stopping me? And they go right down into the water. He baptizes them right there. That's my question for you today. What prevents you, if you've never been baptized, from being baptized? Somebody's like, well, it's a good hair day, Judd, and it's early. And, you know, I don't know, man. I don't want to get my hair wet, all the things. Listen, baptism is the great equalizer. If you have a $150 haircut or a mother shave or, you know, a $5 haircut, whatever you have, look, we're all coming out of the water wet. But Jesus went all the way to the cross for you and the least you can do is get wet in obedience to him. And we've all been there. You're around friends. It doesn't matter. Somebody's like, well, I didn't, bring, I didn't bring a change of clothes. That's okay. We have a full change of clothes for you. You're like, well, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, we have shorts. We have T-shirts. You say, I didn't bring a towel. We have a towel. You're like, what about my things? They'll get wet. We have little Ziploc baggies that you can put your things in so they don't get wet. You're like, what about my car? I don't want my car to get wet. I don't want my car seat to get wet. Well, look, we got trash bags that you could take and you could put on your car seats. I know how some of you are about your car. And so you can put that on your car seat so even your car seat doesn't get wet. And then finally, Finally, somebody's like, I don't have time, and, and I already told you I'm going to let you out of church early, so you're going to be going home at the same time you were going to go anyway. So don't tell me you don't have time. I'm just like, what else you got? Any, any, any other excuses? Because if I can remove them, I want to remove them. Because this is an important thing, and you'll look back, and you'll be like, I'm grateful I did that. Guy came up to me last night. He goes, Hey, you gave that message last year. I said, yeah, it's the baptism message. He goes, you hemmed me in. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, because I got baptized last year. And he goes, this year, I set up the baptismal pools as a volunteer. And so he was standing out there and he's like, that's a good message. You keep giving it. But he's like, look at how God brought it all the way back around. And now I'm out here serving and helping others. That could be you in your life. So here's what I'd like to do. In just a moment, our team's gonna come out. They're gonna lead us in a song. And as we sing, if you'd like to take that step of baptism, I'm gonna encourage you to come out wherever you're at. Just meet me and our team down front here. We're gonna gather down front, and then we'll send you out in just a moment and let you get a head start to go out to our baptismal pool area. We got our team out there. We'll help you get ready, take care of anything you may need, any questions you may have, and then we'll all go celebrate with you at these baptismal pools outside. So would all of you stand together with me? And I'm gonna invite our volunteers as well to come on down front. If you'd like to be baptized, join them. Come on out. Let's put our hands together for people as they come forward and make a spiritual commitment. Let's sing together. Come down to the river that's waiting a little bit deeper now. All saints and all sinners that's waiting a little bit deeper now. Just step out and come down front. Come on. There's grace in this river that's waiting a little bit deeper now. There's peace in this river that's waiting a little bit deeper now. I believe there's more of you out there today that maybe feel God tugging on your heart to take that step of faith today. We're going to just sing this bridge together one more time. If God is tugging on your heart, you step out. Come on, let's sing this. Come down to the river that's waiting a little bit deeper now. All saints and all sinners, let's wait in a little bit deeper now. There's grace in this river that's waiting a little bit deeper now. Let's give it up for all these individuals who stepped out in faith today.
guys could just come in close over here. Pastor Judd's going to come up and has a simple question he would like to ask you. Uh, we're so thrilled for you guys. Let me just ask you, do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? All right, well, based on your confession of faith, it's our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So here's what we're going to do. If you'll just follow uh, that sign right there that says, follow me. <laughs> She's going to lead you right outside. We're going to go right outside these doors on this side. And if you're on this side, we're just going to follow this gentleman right there with that follow me sign. We'll take you right up down the hallway. We're going to let you get a head start. We're going to sing just a little more, and then we'll be out to celebrate with you. All right, let's give it up for him. Come down to the river. Let's wait. And all saints and all sinners, let's wait. 